Good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, of course, for joining us. This is the panel that's called Left Strategies to Exit Crisis, in case you are not aware of that. Unfortunately, the second part of the title kind of got lost in the Left Forum software, so that was named um, Workers' Ownership and Workers' Member Management as a Transformative Strategy, question <laughs> mark. So just that is just the first hint for our topic that we're going to um, address here. The panel, if I might just briefly uh, introduce that, is sponsored and organized by Rosa Luxemburg Foundation um, <coughs> Germany, which is a foundation that is financially close and politically autonomous but friendly to the German left party. And uh, we are very happy to being able to participate in the left forum with some, um, some panels that you will find in the program as well. So the question we are going to address, and we were very happy that we um, could um, engage our panelists in that, is that at least from our perspectives in Germany, the state bailout money for banks and corporations have again, in a way, risen the question of social and democratic control of these sectors or these companies that receive this money. So shouldn't there be a democratic um, control in that sectors or in that companies um, that receive all the state money and what are they going to do with that? So, um, so in some strategic left and union discussions, um, the <coughs> question of employee ownership or cooperatives have um, become a focus on this on strategic questions. And in Germany, it's more a discussion. And as far as I understand, at least in the yes, it's more, you know, you can analyze real experiments and real experiences about uh, these questions, which is not so much the case in, uh, in Germany at the moment. Um, many such projects, uh, if we look in the history, um, as example, for example, in Argentina, at the end of the hour, with the economic crisis of 2001, were born out of necessity and crisis, and as an attempt to deal with the destruct destructive effects of the crisis, runaway shops, unemployment, all these things. And I think for our discussion, it would be um, one question to ask how these enterprises and how these workers' ownership can secure a different everyday experience for the people working there, for example, under the pressure of the global market for which they have to produce, um, and how these experiments or these um, single um, companies could engage in a transformative strategy and overcome kind of this island existence many of them um, are due to, uh, to lead and become kind of a part of a transformative strategy altogether. So that would be a, just a brief question for our panel. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, our panelists. I will just go through them um, at the to my left, it's Rick Will. Probably doesn't need any introduction anymore, as he was opening the panel yesterday night. He's one of the uh, organizers of the Left Forum, and he's um, teaching here in New York, professor in economics, and he has a lot of work done on these questions of workers' ownership and um, economic democracy and so on. And to his right, I'm very sorry that my computer broke down, so I have to do it like this. <laughs> um, there's Emmanuel Nass. He teaches political science at Brooklyn Center, uh, Brooklyn College, City University of New York, and he's an editor of Working USA, um, Journal of Labor and Social Society, and uh, he has published numerous books on the topic. And we are very much awaiting the, the newest one, Our Masters, Our Own, which is about to come out, as I understand. Um, so thank you for being here. And um, next one is Gar Alparowitz. He teaches political economy at the University of Maryland and is the founding principal of the Democratic Collaborative, an organization developing community and working, worker cooperative wealth building. Um, and his name is very much linked in the latest discussion to the, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I just had a small bike out. Um, I'm looking for the, the name of the city. The Cleveland model, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 
And last line, we have um, Florian Moritz, who is working at the German um, Bundestag um, at a, as an economic and political advisor for the party, Die Linke. And um, he, is an, he has studied economics and political science in Cologne and Berlin. And will join us here to add a little bit of the German perspectives of the discussion. So thank you very much for being here. And I would uh, suggest that we just have the panelists speaking one after the other. The group has agreed to begin. We will have about 15 minutes each. And then, of course, we will open up for a common discussion and engage you in that. Oh, and uh, just briefly, my name is Christina Keinel, and I'm working with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. I'm editor of the journal we are publishing, which looks like this. It's unfortunately it's in German, but we brought some samples in English, so which are free. So if you would like to go by our table or just fetch them here, you're very welcome to do so. Okay, so would you like to start? Sure. Thank you very much. I'll just stand here because I talk better when I'm standing, and you can probably hear me a little bit better. Um, many of the other panelists here are, are better equipped and, and more expert than I am in a number of the details of this. So I want to talk about some of the um, larger, maybe even broader philosophical dimensions of this issue. And I'm going to divide my comments between an exit strategy from the current crisis and how worker involvement in production can be part of that. And then I want to talk about worker involvement in production um, in terms of the broader question of <coughs> capitalism and socialism. In terms of the immediate exit strategy, um, I would argue the following. We need to disengage ourselves from the limits of the discourse about the current crisis that are imposed by the overwhelming majority of politicians, journalistic accounts, and academic accounts. Let me explain what I mean. The clearest, quickest, and most direct way to deal with unemployment, massive unemployment here in the United States, numbering in the tens of millions, is for the government to hire these people and to put them to work. There really is nothing short of that in this situation uh, to directly and quickly deal with this problem. Uh, the Obama administration refuses to consider this idea, does not propose this idea, refuses even to debate the idea when a handful of legislators try to bring it up. The Republican and Democratic parties officially uh, reject this as, not, as beneath discussion. That is a, remarkable when you think that back in the 1930s, a Democratic president then, Roosevelt, between 1934 and 1941, uh, created 11 million jobs and filled them, and basically said to the American people, if the private sector cannot provide employment, then it's the job of the public sector. At least the pressure of the unions and the socialists and communists uh, parties at that time uh, forced this. And so we had a public employment program. So as an exit strategy today, it seems to me, uh, the first and obvious thing, the easiest thing, politically in this country at least, would be to demand a public employment program. The reason it's relevant today is that we, at least the left, ought to demand not only a public employment program, but one of a different quality from what it was before. And the basic idea here is that there should be public employment with this difference. Not the government replicating the normal capitalist structure, a board of directors, in this case state officials, who would hire people, who would produce goods and services that might be distributed in the market or might be distributed in some other way. In the 1930s, both, both were tried. That would be not the plan of the left. The plan of the left would be mass employment by the government in enterprises that would be run by the workers in them. What would be new and different would be a mass public employment problem uh, pro uh, program that not only hired people, but located them and organized them in a radically new organization of production. And that would run roughly as follows. 
Monday, to, and I'm using this only as a, as a guide to the idea, Monday to Thursday, everybody would come to work in the enterprise performing whatever function within the division of labor they had been engaged to, to do. On Friday, all these people would come to work and they would have a different function. Their job description would be different. They would sit around all day having meetings. And in those meetings, they would decide what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the net return on the investment of that enterprise. In other words, on Friday, the workers would function as their own board of directors using the corporate model. That's a basic exit strategy that the left would have that would be different from the liberals, the social democrats who want a public employment program, but without this component of the radically reorganized way that these unemployed people would be put to work. So I think it's clear how this would be different from others. Let me talk about some of the implications of this and how it would be marketed in a country like ours. First, one way to market it, it's an extension of democracy from the field of politics to the field of economics. The workers are now making the decisions that they depend on. They have to live, workers in all enterprises have to live with the consequences of the decisions made by the board of directors, the notion of democracy is if you have to live with the consequences of decisions, you ought to be able to participate in them. Here is a practical organizational way for workers to participate in the decisions that they have to live with. What to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. Number two, marketing strategy. This will provide for the first time in the United States freedom of choice. For those of you that are not Americans, you have to understand freedom of choice has a ranking in the culture we live in, right up there with apple pie, baseball, and mommy. So freedom of choice is a good marketing, almost as good as draping a half-naked woman over whatever you're selling. So here's freedom of choice. For the first time, American workers will be able to choose between two kinds of enterprise. And this is how it would be represented. A top-down, capitalist, bureaucratic enterprise. Board of directors, you're a worker, come to work, shut up, and go home. Alternative, there would be an enterprise in which all job descriptions would have two parts, your particular work in the division of labor and your participation in the board of directors. You would be a producer, but also a designer of your work. You would be directed, but also a director of your work. And now all Americans would be able to choose between these two kinds of enterprises and the lives they entail and the skill sets they will have to develop. And this would all be presented as an employment program that has the double benefit of providing an option for everyone to see how such enterprises work. We might even devise clever strategies to allow people to vote as to which of these two kinds of work environments they would prefer themselves to work in. We might even develop a culture which said that a product emerging from these two different kinds of enterprise, traditional capitalist, and this new thing to be named, would have to be shown on the label. So the label would no longer say made in China versus made in Bangladesh. It would also entail what kind of enterprise this object emerged from. So that if you wanted to support one kind of enterprise as a consumer, as opposed to another, just as you now can support fair traded coffee as opposed to something else, you'd have that option. That lit, I would argue, would be a viable political project here in the United States now. And at least as far as I go around the country talking about it, it has a lot of response that I am excited about because way better than what I thought I would encounter when I began talking about this. Let me switch now to the theore a, a theoretical question. The notion of workers being involved in worker enterprise, you will notice, is often accompanied by a set of words that are different worker-owned, worker-managed. And if you listen closely to what I just said, I actually had a third one, and that is worker-directed. So workers can be owners instead of, say, shareholders. Or workers can be the shareholders. Or workers could be some of the shareholders. The relationship to a productive enterprise of ownership is different, for example, from the relationship to a productive enterprise of a manager. So to say that workers are going to be managers is a different thing from saying that workers are going to be owners. 
and of course it's possible that workers could be owners and managers. But I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about workers as the board of directors. And as you know from any kind of corporation, owners, board of directors, and managers are typically different people with different assignments and different powers and roles within an enterprise. What most excites me and what I focus on, and I'm not arguing it's better or worse than focusing on other things, but I'm focusing on workers as directors, not as a, an owners primarily and not as managers. And there are a lot of arguments about which of these roles workers should play, some, all, combinations, and so on. But I'm focusing on workers as directors. And the reason for that comes directly out of Marxian theory, which is the way I think about things. So I'm interested in the workers who produce a surplus in the production apparatus also being the appropriators and distributors of that surplus. That's different from being an owner who doesn't do that, and it's different from being a manager who doesn't do that either. Hence the board of directors is the image I want to focus you on, because that's what I want workers to do <coughs> in such enterprises, to be the directors whether or not they are managers and whether or not they are owners so to keep these three things distinct. Last point from in my introduction. I'd like to link all of this to the issue of capitalism and socialism and, and try to be intentionally a little bit provocative here if the other part hasn't already been there. Um, here's the idea. The history of socialism, as it is received today, that we have to live with, is a history of a way of thinking about capitalism, socialism, that has emphasized, and just I do this for brevity, has emphasized what we might call the macro level of thinking. Socialism and capitalism are distinguished fundamentally over the last hundred years as follows. Socialism is the social or national ownership of the means of production. Capitalism is the private ownership of the means of production. The transition from capitalism to socialism is then the removal of means of production, land, equipment, machines, factories, from private ownership to social ownership managed by a government, hopefully, presumably, a government that represents the workers. The second dimension of the transition from capitalism to socialism, or the difference, has to do with the system of distribution, distributing, distributing resources and distributing products. Instead of a market mechanism to distribute resources and products, we have a planning mechanism to distribute resources and products, the inputs and outputs of production. So socialism becomes a macro-defined entity changing ownership en gros in the big picture and changing the distributive mechanism from market to plan. What is noteworthy about that definition as it guided socialist thought and as it guided the actual policies of socialist society was that it left in the shadow as a secondary issue or ignored altogether the micro, how is the enterprise going to be organized? And to make this very clear, to use a concrete example, think of it this way. Before 1917 in Russia, you went to work as a worker and you produced a surplus that was appropriated by a board of directors of a corporation. After the revolution, you went to work in the same factory, you did exactly the same work, and you produced a surplus that was appropriated by the Council of Ministers of the USSR, a group of state officials who made the decisions on what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the surplus. They were governed, more or less, by a communist party and political power. But the reorganization of the enterprise, the actual transformation of the enterprise, so that the workers in each enterprise functioned as their <coughs> own board of directors, that didn't happen. <coughs> and it wasn't demanded by anybody either. It was a, an understanding of socialism that operated at the macro level. The workers marched to the Winter Palace and delivered their enterprise to Lenin and had made the revolution. And then the next day went back to work because they needed the output. So now the question is, might we have the daring 
to think that socialism for the next century, having learned from the socialism of the 20th century, its strengths, its weaknesses, its mistakes, its achievements, and I really mean that literally, could now define a socialism for the next century which has not only the planning and the socialization of property, but also has, and I'm going to exaggerate now, the missing micro component, the transformation of the enterprise. Final thought. One way to make socialism the attraction and the power for masses of working people in this century that it was in the last one might be to add something that was missing before. Something which means that a socialist transformation has an immediate, powerful effect on every worker's daily life. Your job description is going to change. You're going to be a worker, but you're also going to be a director. And it's not an option. It's as required for you to participate on Friday in being a director as it is for you to participate Monday through Thursday in all the other dimensions of the other part of your job description. Given that our work life is five, to seven, five days out of seven a week, on all day, basically, on that day, it's the single most important activity shaping our lives as adults. Therefore, its transformation make socialism an immediate reality much more palpable in daily life than even was the transition from capitalism to the kind of socialism that was more macro defined <coughs> and more micro deficient. Moreover, finally, the worker would be asked to make the transition himself, herself, in each enterprise and then to protect it and then to reproduce it over time. That takes a lot of work to learn the skills of, manage, of, of directors, to learn how to do those things, to learn how to work together. It becomes a project of transformation in the most intimate, daily, transformative sense. And I think it would restructure and refigure what socialism means in a way that leftists like us could take to the mass of people without the risk of it being assumed it's a replication of the socialisms of the past, which most folks have rejected, partly for reasonable reasons and partly because of the stereotypic dismissals that the culture is full of. We could recuperate what's best in that tradition, add this micro component that transforms what it means, and have a vision that is so often demanded of the left <clears throat> that is concrete and powerful and that may make the difference in making a political step forward. So that's why, for me, the discussions, the explorations of worker taking over the process of enterprise has the enormous potential that the left hasn't paid enough attention to, present company accepted, since these are the folks who have been doing this kind of work. But it, it seems to me that this needs now to be brought forward as an absolutely central component to what the next phase of, of a research of left can be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, good, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll try to speak loud, too. Um, not a morning person, but I guess if I speak loud, I'll force myself to be. Um, I uh, echo uh, a lot of the comments that were made earlier. I'll try to provide a historical and a contemporary and perhaps future um, a future understanding of how we could uh, move forward with respect to the United States um, uh, and what have been recent actions that uh, have been uh, embarked upon, what are their strengths, their possibilities, uh, and limitations. Um, uh, I'd like to just give a very brief periodiza periodization of the history of U.S. worker control, the 19th century is one where uh, workers in craft industries exercised a, a tremendous amount of control over their production and productive capacity, uh, usually through control over skill, control over the goods themselves, and they had a portion of the means of production that they brought to the table. In mass industrial settings, workers uh, lost that edge. And this is something that um, 
uh, I think we need to recognize that uh, mass industry itself takes a, was a capitalist means, and it continues to be, to in different fashions, uh, to reduce the power of workers by eliminating their skills. A um, number of people have written about this already. Uh, David Noble, who recently passed on, <coughs> is one of the leading proponents of the notion of how the skilling takes place. Uh, I'd like to formulate this in uh, a, a number of ways. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I want to look at the, do, wh why would employers oppose worker control? Uh, secondly, uh, why do workers want them? Um, the first point, uh, employers are adamantly set against worker control because of the ideological dimension. Uh, the very fact that even if a, a factory goes bankrupt, the employer will not want, and the employing and capitalist class will, will oppose workers taking over that factory, not because the factory has uh, any value to them, but because, or to capital as a whole, but because it creates the, the space uh, by which workers themselves could demonstrate that the possibilities of uh, actually administering and uh, running a factory or enterprise or service uh, is uh, feasible and can be done so in a much more efficient way that is less despotic and much more democratic. Um, and I think this ideological uh, factor is woven throughout American history uh, where it, the employing classes in this country have consistently over uh, the last hundred years or so and before uh, opposed any kind of worker uh, efforts to control production. Now, the way I look at production, I think a lot of others, uh, worker control, is, a, is through the process of how which uh, workers take control and the reasons why they take control. And I think we could, uh, with respect to the employer opposition, look at the early period, and uh, the early period, let's say, of mass production, um, following the um, uh, introduction of uh, the assembly line and so forth, uh, and the incredible profits that gigantic uh, uh, employers like General Motors were able to uh, extract, and Emerson Electric, two companies that uh, uh, faced uh, examples of uh, worker uh, self-management, or at least attempts to control uh, the factory, um, were uh, fighting against. So let me just very briefly give you that, that historical context. With, with, it's kind of ironic because I think we are coming back to the United Auto Workers, or maybe not the United Auto Workers, but the auto sector in the American economy today. But first of all, we, we have the, the, the 1937 Flint sit-down strike. Uh, uh, <coughs> many of you here know that history. I won't get into the uh, specifics of it, and time does not permit me to. But uh, it was a battle uh, that uh, went on for uh, several days mu and running up to it uh, months in which uh, the workers wanted a union. What kind of union that would be was a question, although I, and it was not very clear whether it would be a, a union that would be dominated by leaders at the top or one that would be controlled by workers themselves. And the workers thought that in the early part of uh, the century, that if they would have a union, they would actually be able to control the production process, or at least limit the level of exploitation. So that's one of the points that I make, uh, and we should make, I think, understanding worker control. We should see that the, the levels in which workers can, in fact, exert a degree of power over their daily lives. So for instance, if you could um, have a four-hour day instead of a five-hour day, a six-hour day instead of a seven-hour day. That's in a, certain, in a certain way a means of controlling your production or your, your, your effort uh, during the, uh, in a capitalist process. We don't really have examples of socialist uh, transformations in the United States, obviously. Uh, what is interesting in the early era, both at UAW and Emerson Electric in St. Louis, UAW and Flinton, 
Emerson in, in St. Louis, which was one of the largest uh, takeovers as well, uh, is that, um, first of all, there was a tremendous amount of support amongst workers for this idea of controlling the production process. Uh, and I actually take that uh, very seriously. If you take, uh, look at the literature, uh, people like Rosemary Fire wrote an excellent book on uh, milit militancy in the Midwest. Uh, she demonstrates in which the ways in which uh, workers at the UE plant at Emerson Electric uh, were completely in support of taking over the factory, uh, occupying the factory, and possibly even control, you know, running the factory uh, in, within a capitalist economy. Uh, and uh, the, the Emerson Electric uh, struggle is uh, one that we should look to as an example of the degree to which this yearning of, uh, I'll say, American workers for uh, control over the factory and its, uh, or any other kind of workplace, remained, was certainly part of the dialogue uh, 60 and 70 years ago, and also remains uh, through various numbers of actions that have taken place over the last 70 years, and more contemporaneously, uh, a very important uh, element uh, in the uh, history of American working class. Workers want to control some element of their uh, factory. Uh, now we, we could contrast, and I would contract the, contrast the period of uh, the 1920s, <coughs> 30s, and 40s, uh, and today where industrial production was uh, growing, where the United States economy, and uh, Rick would probably be better than that, I could talk a lot more about that than I can, with respect to the economy was at, a, uh, at, at its apogee, uh, and today where we see the closure of factories. And at the same time, we also have the same kinds of desires at radically different points in time, one where the economy is at uh, uh, its high point, and now we're at a, uh, you know, at least from the manufacturing perspective, uh, at a low point, uh, that workers continue to seek ways in which they could either maintain a factory, uh, control the process in some ways, uh, and there's kind of a, uh, once again, a process under which workers can either take control or not take control. And it usually takes place within a crisis. Um, and that crisis uh, is one in which I, I have to say that we have to really take a look at the uh, legal framework of the United <coughs> States. Uh, and the uh, unequivocal support of the state for capital. Uh, this is uh, without question uh, a uh, place where capital has uh, hegemonic support in, uh, from the state. Uh, uh, you know, you could talk to anybody around the world and you say, well, you know, capital has influence in the United States. In fact, they, they, they are able to stop a lot of labor and working class efforts you know, you go to other parts of the world, and they say, are you kidding me? Of course they do. I mean, there's absolutely no question. You know, you should start probably from the point of, and the perspective of how workers can actually fight back. Uh, so people are, and I, I guess back in the uh, debate between Miliband and uh, Galantzis, et cetera, in the 70s and 80s, there people were, you know, contemplating the degree to which capital has a degree of support and the way in which the working class has supported this country. I, I think that debate, I kind of agree that that debate is interesting and so forth, but it's, if you take a look at the, the decisions that were made, Fan Steel decision of 1939, which uh, completely eliminated the capacity of workers to occupy factories, which is the first stage and one of the first stages uh, in control, um, was uh, very interesting because uh, workers continued to control factories even after fan steel. They said, well, don't we have the right to do so? <coughs> and case after case, we see the traditional union, uh, which is what I'll just use as the moniker for any union in the United States besides a few, uh, would engage in to um, stop their workers. So for instance, the United Auto Workers in the 1940s when they were facing strikes at other plants, either at Chrysler or or GM, and again, 
uh, workers would say, well, don't we have the right to take over the factory? In fact, took over portions of the factory. And uh, you, know, you could read Sidney Fine's work, which is excellent on the subject. And the workers were, would be uh, told by their uh, shop stewards or the union leadership, no, you cannot take over the factory. You have to go back to work. You have to do this and that. Those same elements continue to this day, by the way. Um, and every time, uh, we can go to the 1970s and to the present uh, and the 80s, every time there's an effort by workers to find a means to enter the production process and have a say not to close the plant, to keep it open, not only to keep it open, but to keep it open under conditions that are more favorable to workers, they are shut down by their union leaders. And this is the story of the, what I would call the evisceration of the United Auto Workers in this country, which has become a sham that actually, e echoing workers' workers ownership, uh, United Auto Workers, I don't know what percentage stake they have in uh, General uh, Motors, but it really doesn't matter to the workers because General Motors is going to be, a, this year there might be a major strike when uh, mm -hmm. an arbitrator imposes an agreement on uh, this next round of bargaining, which is supposed to take this year. So rather than $14 an hour, an arbitrator might say, without benefits or <coughs> benefits, $11 an hour. Uh, and that's actually, may cause a crisis within the union itself. It may even break apart the, the union. Greg Shotwell, who's a rank and file uh, organizer, from Flint, <coughs> Michigan, and uh, runs a uh, organization, one of many people called uh, um, uh, Live Bait and Ammo is one of his uh, uh, organizations, uh, and Solidarity uh, uh, within the UAW. He argues very vociferously that there is going to be a major movement this summer uh, that's going to emerge within the uh, auto workers when they get a contract that's shoved down their throat. Because if the United UAW does not accept or cannot agree to a contract with uh, the federal government, I guess, or, they, or, the, or GM, which is making huge profits, uh, or in fact agrees with GM to reduce the w w wages in some ways, workers are either going to go on strike or there's going to be an imposition of an agreement if UAW in some ways says we want higher wages and that pre represents a huge transformation in the way collective bargaining takes place in the United States. Just very briefly with respect to that, um, <coughs> when we look at uh, collective bargaining, I, I see it as a democratic right, uh, and what is missing in the uh, process is uh, the fact that workers have lost their uh, seat at the bargaining table. You have corporate managers, including UAW officers, uh, I'm sorry to say, that are engaged in discussing how to reduce worker rate wa wages in a significant uh, fashion. Yet at the same time, we also have activists who are internal <coughs> to the UAW who have not sold out, who have not part been, become part of the, uh, the structure of leadership, who are continuing to fight both within the union and without. Uh, and. Um, Many people see what's happened in Michigan uh, in the last two, three years as uh, the basis for uh, future struggles. I think we really uh, need to understand the um, differential between um, the kinds of control that workers can uh, engage in. And we're not talking about necessarily Argentina's because, well, uh, under capitalism, <coughs> it's very difficult to uh, envision, especially American brand of capitalism, uh, a way in which workers can have uh, complete uh, control over a factory and de de determine what, ca what to produce. But with uh, the UAW and the, with the uh, auto industry uh, going down, one can see possibilities for workers to uh, uh, try their best to um, <coughs> perhaps decide what to produce in, in different contexts. Uh, the, the two most interesting examples, uh, however, do not, in the recent times, uh, do not come from the uh, auto workers, but uh, from uh, the United, Ele uh, United UE, United Electrical Workers. And many of you know uh, there have been struggles over 
more than two, actually. There have been struggles uh, with respect to Republic uh, Window and Door. Carrie Leiderson has written extensively about it, <coughs> she's here. Uh, and the other it was the more recent effort in Taunton, Massachusetts, to keep the factory open. Uh, in general, workers want their benefits, but and they, they want their redundancy pay, as they would say in the UK uh, and Ireland, uh, and if they don't get it, they'll take over a factory. There has been a wave of factory takeovers in uh, Europe uh, in 2008, 2009. Um, some of them have continued to this day. Uh, the, the more recent efforts uh, are now revolving around uh, how uh, workers could, in fact, um, create their own structures that are outside of the, u the traditional <coughs> unions. Uh, and uh, most commentators, I don't have any more minutes, I have time to two minutes. Uh, uh, the, some very important commentators have really spoken of the bankruptcy of the traditional union today. Which uh, you know, I was uh, going to quote uh, Isfahan Misaros on the subject that uh, in a recent work he said, "For the ironical and in many ways tragic result of long decades of political struggle within the confines of capital's self-serving political institutions, turned out to be that under the new prevailing conditions, the working class has been totally disenfranchised in all of the." capitalistically advanced and not so advanced countries. This condition is marked by the full conformity of the various organized working class representatives to the rules of the parliamentary game, parliamentary or collective bargaining <coughs> game, massively prejudiced against the organized force of labor and the long established and constantly renewed power relations of capitals materially and ideologically most effective rule over the social order in the entirety. Uh, and essentially, what I think we need to look at, and we shall see in the mo months and years to come very soon, uh, are factions uh, or divisions or solid units of solidarity within traditional unions coming together on the shop floor, within the service sector and elsewhere, to say that we want a role in the decision making <coughs> over uh, what to produce, in this case UAW, just as a moment, a moment ago I was going to say an example, would be for instance the elimination of, or at least the reduction of production of for, for uh, uh, the car and more uh, green technologies. People have talked about that, uh, maybe we'll hear about that uh, today a little bit more. Uh, and. Um, What's so interesting, I would say, is that I think there might be some state support, or at least some state sympathy for workers who are on strike demanding that, uh, or taking over factories that have been closed down, demanding that they reopen those factories as they did at uh, Republic Window and Door, uh, demanding that those factories be reopened as green technology right. factories and so forth. So anyway, um, I am very optimistic uh, in this context. I think that there's huge possibilities. Uh, I think that unions must transform themselves or be transformed by the workers themselves, which, uh, once again, the US story is one that is uh, filled with uh, contradictions and one where you have tremendous amount of power of capital over labor, but on the other hand, a history of militancy that uh, is probably unparalleled amongst capitalist countries um, over the last uh, hundred years or so. Well, thank you for uh, your time. And I'm going to sit here and just <coughs> I clear my throat to speak from here. Uh, a couple preliminaries. Um, there are a couple of web, a website where you can find more information, www.community-wealth. Put the dash in because there's another organization without that. <laughs> and uh, there's a piece in The Nation, March 2010, which talks about some of this in a little bit more detail. Um, some other preliminaries. Manufacturing is now 9% of the labor force, probably declining. So we need to broaden our perspective on what we're talking about in all of this. 7%, um, 6%, much of the discussion historically has been in manufacturing. That is not to say we shouldn't talk about manufacturing, but we're missing huge 
the dominant sectors in the economy, if you talk only about manufacturing. Second, um, the most, one of the most interesting experiences, though it has lots of problems with genuine worker direction internally, is Mondragon. Uh, and mo the Mondragon experience, as I said, we could, in the discussion, we could critique it. But nonetheless, it's very interesting. And, and from the point of view of worker participation in actual control, design, and et cetera. Uh, it is a market-driven structure. It is running into the world market. It has a lot of capitalist problems of, of that kind. But it, nonetheless, it's a very interesting experience. Um, and the United States steel workers have just signed an agreement, as many of you know, to try to introduce Mondragon principles and set up Mondragon-style worker ownership uh, in the United States and Canada. So it is relevant in that respect. Um, Third, I think that the issues of, um, third, third issue, in the United States in particular, the notion of democratizing ownership as a principle has not been present in much of the broad-based discussion. So one of the things that the democracy collaborative that we've been doing is attempting simply to remind and introduce people to the notion that there is a lot of democratized ownership of various kinds, not only for instance, 20% of the U.S. electrical production is either municipal or co-op. Most people don't know that. There are 11,000 ESOPs. ESOPs have a lot of problems, worker-owned companies and through the ESOP, there are a lot of problems. But there are more people involved in worker-owned companies through the ESOP structure than there are members of unions in the private sector. There is ownership as a principle, and in certain parts of the country, Ohio in particular, where there's been more experience with ownership, even in the ESOP form, participation and control grows. So, but the most important point is that the idea is not foreign to America, and there are 120 million American co-op members, which we need to remember, a third of the population, the membership of co-ops. So one can elaborate the many, many things in the society that are so American that need to be discussed and are not foreign ideologically and, and build on that. Having said that, um, there are some problems. We're, I've, we're, I've been working on worker ownership in one form or another since 1977 in the Youngstown Sheet and Tube where Thought and Lynn and I and a number of people with a, with a religious coalition put forward a plan and got broad popular support not only in Youngstown but from every major politician, including the conservatives in the state of Ohio, for a plan to take over the whole steel industry and make it worker community ownership because the city was in such trouble. So I, the point about that is the notion of putting forward a very concrete plan, very American and very real and practical, not rhetorical, is open to really serious discourse because the crisis is so deep. And it's very important, which means that you from my point of view, you better be damn serious about what you're talking about, you're not rhetorical. Why this will work. And if you can do that, you find we're finding very interesting. I'm going to describe a couple of interesting places where that discussion is open. Now, I should, I should say I'm a bit of an optimist. I'm from Wisconsin, so you know, trust me. <laughs> and uh, that, whole, that whole Wisconsin tradition is that you may actually be able to move things. We had a socialist mayor in, in Milwaukee until 10 years ago, uh, called himself a socialist at least, and got elected regularly. Um, so anyway, but nonetheless, speaking about these issues in very practical terms, which means you got to do your homework, is very open in my experience at the local level, not in the national ideological level, but at the local level and the state level. Show me a plan that works, and show me participation. That's great. Make, make but sure, tell me it'll work. So those things are the, pr are the principles we've been working on. <coughs> Having said that. Um, I think there is a third. There's another area that progressives and the left haven't dealt with which is, it's not only ownership, and it's not only the internal design and management and direction of the firm, it is the political theory of democratizing ownership within the system. So for instance, if you really believe in worker ownership, then at worker control and direction of every sector, do you want to give the police ownership and control to the police sector? Obviously, you don't want worker ownership. You want community democratized control of that sector with some form of participation. That's only an example. The same, que same question comes up in terms of national industry and regional. Another question about the political theory that needs to be addressed. This system is, the, you know, continent. You can drop Germany, on, I think, at Oklahoma. We, re we don't realize how big our system is. There's no Cairo. There's no Berlin. It's a, they move jobs around when there's a problem in any part of the country. So what is the scale that we're talking about? Are we regionalizing? And what is the relationship of 
communities to units within called worker ownership. And that whole set of questions is critical because it, it presents the problem of how a collectivity, a polity, a society, a large community relates to any sector. Now the traditional syndicalist model was that the workers in sectors controlled rather than the community, which is a broader conception. So these again, by way of preliminaries, I, some of this is discussed in my book, uh, America Beyond Capitalism. What is the theory of democratization itself and within that, the units? So I'm going to preface all, <laughs> that's all preface. Uh, because I think we need, we, it's a time when we need to drive ourselves into these problems in both a practical way and a theoretical way, in a way that we haven't done. It's not just worker takeovers and worker ownership. That presents really interesting problems. In Argentina, what's presented almost immediately is the role of the worker-owned companies to the city and the state to the larger community. And the ones that are succeeding substantially are the ones in which they <coughs> establish purchasing power from the state, namely Buenos Aires, to the small the units. That becomes a model of planning. That's a mini model of planning of a collectivity called the city municipality purchasing from the worker-owned units. And that's a decentralized democratic planning system, semi-socialist in that structure, but it isn't just worker ownership. The problem of surplus. Does every firm get to control its own surplus? Do the oil workers get to control all the surplus while the garbage workers control their surplus? Uh, but that's the question about worker ownership and control and direction. What is the relationship of one firm to the larger system and the allocation of the surplus? So these, that raises the political problem. So I want to put all that out there because I think now is the time when all, all of this needs to be addressed. I mean, I'm, as you can see, deeply into this. But I think these issues have to be sorted out on our side or we won't actually know what we're talking about in terms of where we're going. Having said that, let me describe two things about uh, a couple of real experiences that we've been working with in, in direct ways. Um, Youngstown Sheet and Tube shut down in 1977 had an interesting result. <clears throat> in the state of Ohio, there are more people trying to do worker ownership probably per capita, mostly through ESOPs but also through co-ops, than probably any other state per capita. Partly as an ideological and cultural result of the Youngstown fight. The people who undertook the Youngstown fight were very clear about it, that there was a very small chance of success, but a very large chance of opening a new debate in the country in that state about what might be possible. And indeed, that's what's happened. You find some of the key people in Ohio talk realistically about doing things in Ohio that people elsewhere don't take as seriously as a practical matter. Uh, you know, as a historian, that's, I see that as the most important thing because we've developed in that area a different culture, a fragments of a culture that are supportive over time, experimentation, trying different things, and, allow, and, and above all, building expertise. You can't do this stuff unless you know what you're talking about. There's a guy named uh, I'm black, John Logue, who recently died, came out of, inspired by the Youngstown of experience, set up a center at Kent State University, and learned how technically to make this stuff work if you actually want to work on it, develop it. So that experience is part and parcel of it. That's a long way of saying that one of the most interesting experiments that we've been partly involved with is in the city of Cleveland. Some of you have heard about the so-called Cleveland experiment. Uh, this involves a series of integrated worker ownerships now on the ground uh, involving a large-scale industrial-scale laundry, uh, ecologically the most uh, ecologically green laundry in the Midwest probably, um, a, a solar installation <coughs> firm, another worker-owned company. These are related. I'll tell you how they're related in a minute. And just about to open, uh, and this is the one I like best, a <coughs> industrial-scale greenhouse, uh, again, worker ownership and control, and direction um, uh, sufficiently, the scale is five million heads of lettuce a year. So these are not mini co-ops. These are significant scale. They are, and here's the interesting design features, they are oriented in part towards the purchasing power of either public or quasi-public or publicly heavily funded institutions. It's very much like Buenos Aires, only different. In this case, hospitals and universities. In that city, and this is really important for other cities, and it's true in every, every major city, in that particular part, it's called the University Circle area, $3 billion of purchases 
in addition to salaries and in addition to construction by the universities and hospitals. Three billion dollars substantially okay. allocated through public funds, health care, education funding. None of it bought in the city of Cleveland. None of it. Some of that is now being directed through a complicated process towards these particular firms. And that's a mini operation of worker-owned firms oriented in part towards a substantially dominated public market which has the same features in its design of, that I described in terms of what's happened in Buenos Aires. That, now notice I said partially. The problem with state planning is state planning. What role does the market play at, if at all, as a corrective to some of the things we know about any system of planning that is state, state dominated? So there's an experiment going on there with some openness of the market to broadening an experiment. Another part of this, which is, has not been publicized and not very uh, well discussed, uh, is this. They are, these co-ops, and they're building more, they expect, their hope is to build 50 of them over time, linked together with a common funding source, a sort of bank internal to it. They pay back 10% of their profits, they pay back their loans to a community structure designed to build more. And a nonprofit corporation links them together. So these are not free and separate worker-owned companies. The history of worker-owned companies in the United States, in Europe, and in Latin America when they are free and operating alone is not a great history. Many of them tend to, they tend to dissolve into the market. They, become, they replicate the same principles that any market-driven firm are. They become capitalist firms that live or die. These, the, the design here is aimed at a different market structure but it is also aimed at rebuilding the community, not just the worker firms. And the structure at this point is a nonprofit corporation that links these together with predominant control by the worker-owned own companies of their own production, but not of the overall game. So that's, the, that's a sketch, that's the architecture that's being developed in that particular model. And let me say this, it is extremely American. It is very, very open and discussed in the community. It is not a problem. It is supported by left, right, radical, labor, even some of the small businessmen, their market improves. It is practical. And you can discuss this stuff and develop it in a way because it makes sense to people. So that design feature, I want to lay that down because the design has been very carefully thought about. That is to say, it is aimed at the community it does have worker ownership and worker control in the firms, but it is not a freestanding model. It is a linked model, and it is aimed at a planning system or quasi-planning system, uh, the sketch of the larger structures. In the Nation article, I projected uh, with my colleagues what you would do if you actually had built mass transit, rail, high-speed rail, all public money, all taxpayer money, an entirely new industry is going to be created. The Chinese are hungry for it, the Spaniards are hungry for it, the French that all could be the same model. It's a planning system, public market, and you could set up the different structures along the same principles. So I want to urge those larger set of questions are implicit in all these models. Um, so finally, so let me say, how am I, how am I doing on time? Well, you're good. Okay. Like right. like the, the thing to say about Cleveland is, uh, Cleveland is a model. It is not, it's an experiment. It is, it came out of it, it is, did not come out of a conflict situation, did not come out of an organizing situation. It doesn't tell us anything about that. It only offers a model. It was, came out of a unique situation in Ohio. When it is replicated, and there are a lot of cities that want to replicate it now, we're finding organizers who are looking at it from an organizing point of view. We're finding city governments that are progressive city governments looking at it from what can this city government do. But the model itself is a it was extremely top-down in its design and development. That's how it started. It's a unique situation. I do not offer that as an answer to the organizing problem. I'm only saying that it poses some practical ways of going forward that could be taken up by, and many, by organizers and activists, po political ad advocacy, that can build that into a different structure. One of the things that's very interesting is how uh, Rick has run into the same response. We're, we're finding people this is very positively received. People are very interested in doing this. They don't see it as foreign. They don't see it as difficult. They, don't, they see it as progressive and positive in their own communities. So we're getting requests, and we're just advisors to this and help design it. And 
<coughs> our staff, one of our staff people from the Democracy Collaborative, actually moved to Cleveland to help work on it because it became so so interesting uh, to, to help develop this model. Um, but the interest around the country in the model it, it is very is not regarded as foreign. It's regarded as extremely positive, American, and and what what do you do in our communities? So let me come back to the issue. The crisis is developing as many, you know, is as obvious, but in particular it's developing with intensity in geographic areas, in particularly big cities. And you see it in the cities, and the cities are partly anchored by what's there. And there is no answer. There is no answer in most communities. And so coming not simply from within the companies where you get a strike or which you, you break down, from within the larger community, there's no way to go forward. So either you just continue to disintegrate. Cleveland went from 800,000 to less than 400,000, worse in Detroit, or you begin attempting something new. No one believes in small business will do it anymore. No one believes you can get big businesses. Well, some people think you get big companies in, lure them in, and they go away. There is a growing awareness at the geographic community level that there has to be a new answer or there will be disintegration. And it's into that context that these ideas begin to make genuine sense in the local communities and the ideology disappears entirely if the plan is practical, real, and, and then people like the notion of participation. They like the notion of ownership. They like the notion <coughs> of control. They like the notion of anchoring. One of the advantages from the point of view of geographic community politically is worker-owned or worker-controlled companies do not get up and go, whereas the big corporations do. So if you see it from that lens, there's a whole different argument that about all of this from the point of view of how do you build community? What do you do in a city? What do you do about the community? Anchoring jobs, as well as owning, as well as directing the surplus and directing part of the surplus, is a real set of questions that makes very real sense in cities that are dying. So I want to urge that piece of the puzzle be opened up as well. Uh, this larger question, one of the larger questions that just has to come back, and, and I think I'm glad that Rick raised it in terms of national ownership of some, I don't know, some, he didn't say which ones, but some industries. What do you do about big industry? If there is national ownership and there is control and direction of the surplus by the sectors, you've got a real problem about market and planning. Because if the firms set the direction, that's a market system. If the planning system sets the direction, that's a political economic decision. And we haven't sorted that out yet. Uh, David Schweiker tries to do it in his book. Uh, it's a very interesting book because he, pro he projects worker, own worker direction and worker participation within nationalized industries. But if you leave it open to the market, you also run into ecological problems. Because the market will drive you into cutting costs. It will drive you into a growing faster than the next guy kills. It'll take your market and you'll be into an ecologically destructive path. So this mix between a planning system that is partly worker controlled at the local level, the reconstruction of community as a polity becomes a question about ecological sustainability as well. Because if you don't get at the market, you will be, you will be, they will beat you at the next date, the gate. Let's say firms that live in the market have to grow, not only out of accumulate, accumulate, but out of fear that the next guy will take your market. And that means you've got to cut costs, and that means you've got to externalize <coughs> into the environment. So unless you can solve that problem by some stabilized planning system, you can't deal with ecological issues. But we think, again, you've got to come back to the planning system in some way as a community, either a locality, a region, or a nation, as a community, a polity that is collective in its general nature, and that can handle this through some kind of a planning system that stabilizes the context rather than the market, uh, or you can't handle it. On the other hand, the role of the market as a corrective in some form turns out to be very important in virtually all systems. And the question how we get that balance serious, taken very seriously rather than rhetorically is I think right on our, on our, on our plate right now. So if I, one last thing, and I think you can see I'm running out of time. I, I want to urge, uh, I think what's really what interesting is that this is a time when all of these subjects can be talked about to anybody. I think the left has been self-isolating, partly through rhetoric, partly through stance, partly through style. I don't think that's true at all. I think you can talk, and again, I'm from Wisconsin, so I think you can talk about these things in any community facing these difficulties if you offer all the questions I just discussed, I think are on the table and open to serious discussion amongst a very broad group who would not identify as the left at all, but are interested in serious answers, practical answers, community, 
worker participation, solving the problem. None of, none of it does, is a problematic anymore, I think. And I think we, we need to not be self-isolating about, about this kind of stuff. Enough said. Thank you very much. <coughs> Are we in your way? Pardon? Are we in your way here? No, I don't think so. No. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I prepared a sh short presentation, uh, some slides. Uh, my name is Florian Moritz. I work for the uh, German Left Party in the uh, German Bundestag. <coughs> Let me first say a few words about my workplace. Uh, the Deutsche Bundestag is the national parliament of Germany. Uh, it elects the chancellor, prepares and adopts legislation, scrutinizes the work of the government. Um, and I work for uh, the party Die Linke, which got uh, almost 12% uh, of the vote at the last federal elections and uh, has now 76 uh, members of parliament. Um, Die Linke uh, is the German word for the left, so. Uh, you see what kind of party we are. Uh, <laughs> and we are also seated far to the left in the parliament, uh, even left to the Social Democrats, and the Greens are uh, quite in the middle, the Green Party in Germany, um, quite in the center. Uh, I don't have more time to say about the party now, uh, but I got some information material if anybody wants to know more. Uh, I got some there, and also at the um, booth of the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, yeah, but what I want to talk, uh, talk about is um, the position or the discussion within my party about <coughs> uh, worker ownership. Um, first, I have to say that uh, this is all work in progress and everything I'm going to talk about is still in discussion. We don't have a, a fixed uh, position yet or an all-embracing uh, um, position concerning worker ownership. Um, but at least we have some important quotes within important papers uh, of our party, um, which deal with uh, ownership and um, <coughs> the question of, uh, of um, uh, how to distribute the power that goes along with ownership of productive capital uh, plays an important role within my party. Um, since we are a young party, uh, we do not have an all-embracing party program yet or um, a party platform where all the positions are written down. Uh, but we have a first draft of such a program and hopefully <coughs> um, this draft is going to be accepted by the members with a few changes uh, by autumn uh, 2011 and in this draft it says uh, we intend to transfer large structure setting industrial companies to demo democratic social ownership and to overcome capitalist ownership. Which sectors, companies and plants are to be covered um, by democratic socialization and what form of public or collective ownership should be chosen, state, municipal, uh, cooperative or staff, has to be decided in a democratic process. In another program, in the federal election program from 2009, um, it says the link demands democratize business, give personal a share in the big corporations, grant government aid only in exchange for equivalent ownership uh, for government and personal. Um, actually, this last point was already proposed by the Linke in Parliament uh, when the German car company Opel, a daughter of General Motors, was in trouble because of the financial crisis. Uh, we brought in a motion demanding the government should only grant aid to Opel in exchange for equivalent ownership for government and uh, workers. So we were talking about that earlier. Uh, um, we brought in a motion, but unfortunately the other parties didn't like it that much, so it didn't go through. Um, Okay, as I said, there's still a debate going on about, uh, about worker ownership and what it's all about, but um, generally um, worker ownership is discussed as part of uh, a broader concept of economic democracy. Um, I'll be real quick here as well. Um, uh, economic democracy is in interpreted um, differently by different people, but I try to uh, show different aspects that you could include into that concept. Here you could probably add others and um, <laughs> and put some away um, as you like, but because it's a it's a it's a broad discussion, what is ego economic democracy? Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, to build an economic democracy, you need a progressive economic policy on the macro level to create uh, jobs and to reach a just distribution of income and so on. Um, second, and this is an important uh, position of Die Linke, also compared to other parties. Um, 
you need to stop and uh, reverse uh, privat privatizations of state-owned uh, companies that, uh, that are still going on, those uh, privatizations. Um, the third part, the third thing mm, I put in brackets because we don't know yet, there's a discussion that we don't know yet how to really design a system of chambers and councils of self-governing bodies of certain regions or certain <coughs> um, uh, um, yeah, or, cer or certain uh, parts of the indu or certain industries. Um, so I put it in brackets because it's a it's an old discussions how to build such chambers and councils, but uh, still we're not very concrete with that. Um, I'll come back to the worker ownership later. Um, the next point: strengthening co-determination. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, the Linke stands for uh, strengthening of the German system of uh, co-determination. We. Uh, we have quite an interesting system of code determination, which is which could I could talk about very long, but I don't have the time for that. Um, just to give you uh, just to give you an example, um, um, for example, we want that workers have 50% of the seats in the board of directors of large corporations, which is uh, at the moment only uh, the case for very few companies in Germany and very large ones. Um, yeah, that's just one example. Um, yeah, the last point is interesting because uh, Rick and Gar were uh, talking about that earlier. Um, is how to democratize <coughs> also public companies and companies that are not privatized or where the privatization <laughs> has been uh, reversed. You know uh, that, that are state-owned. How to um, how to get uh, um, how to uh, integrate other stakeholders like environmental organizations, for example, in the de decision-making process and in the planning process. So how could this work? So uh, I put it in brackets because we don't have good answers yet <laughs> or not uh, final answers yet. Um, coming back to worker ownership, um, there's different things that you could uh, discuss um, among, that, uh, among that topic, uh, worker ownership. First of all, <coughs> it's clear that we want to promote existing cooperatives that you have in Germany and uh, you can promote them for example, with financial aid and also with more information about those cooperatives, because in Germany, um, if you want to, if you want to um, <coughs> found a new co uh, a new um, company, a new firm, uh, you won't find much information about the um, the form of cooperatives and the possibility to build a co cooperative. So information is needed and so on. Um, the second point would be promoting worker ownership in non cooperatives. So promoting worker shop, uh, wor <laughs> promoting uh, worker ownership in companies that are just regular, privately owned uh, uh, capitalist uh, companies. And you could divide that part uh, in promoting worker ownership in those regular <coughs> capitalist uh, um, companies in during good times or in, uh, in a prospering economy or um, as a second part in case of an insolvency of that uh, private company or in, in case of a, of a crisis. Um, Okay, as I said, it's, uh, this is all uh, discussion going on and it's all work in progress, so these are not the final positions of my party or so. Um, but I want to talk about uh, a few things that are discussed among, uh, among the people <laughs> in my party. Um, okay, uh, first of all, there is already a system of promoting worker ownership in capitalist companies in Germany. Um, we have laws that promote capital participation of the employees through tax reliefs, for example. Probably you got that in, in the US as well, you get that probably in, in all kinds of countries. Uh, however, those programs, they have nothing to do with economic democracy or so. It's basically um, a measure to promote a higher saving rate and private pension plans among the workers. And the majority share ownership, of course, is not intended. Uh, other problems are that those capital participations as they exist might go at the expense of the wages. Also, there might be a double risk for workers, the risk of uh, losing their jobs and the risk of losing the capital. <laughs> so um, anyway, this, this is the existence si existent system is not that uh, what we are talking about. Uh, one thing that we are, or some people are discussing within the, uh, within the, lift, uh, in the left is a system uh, or a concept similar to that um, of the main economist in Czechoslovakia at the time of the Prague Spring, Ota Sik. Um, he proposed what he called a neutralization of capital um, capital ownership would then not be bound to individuals, but to the production collective as a whole. Uh, SIG called this collective the asset holding company, and this asset holding company would administer the assets as a trustee 
and place them at the disposal of an operational management company for productive utilization. Um, the members of both bodies of the operational management company and this asset holding company would be elected by the workers. Yeah, the, the idea behind that is that uh, the capital always stays in the company. Um, if a worker leaves the company, he doesn't take his shares with him or so, but it stays uh, in the collective. <coughs> um, also, six idea was to slowly turn normal capitalist companies into production collectives. Uh, for that purpose, parts of the profits, or uh, rather of new investment, um, become property of the asset holding company and become neutral uh, capital. Um, the advantage would be to make a change in property structures and in power relations possible without expropriating the former private owners. So just, uh, uh, you're not uh, taking away anything from any anyone, but uh, um, just whatever comes on top, the new investment and stuff, uh, goes into the hands of the workers or of the production collective. <coughs> uh, however, a lot of questions remain with that concept that are not totally clear. For example, uh, what influence the old shareholders would have as long as the capital is not fully <coughs> utilized, and what incentives those shareholders should have to invest their part of the profits. But because, of course, uh, um, if I would be the private owner and, and had, a say, uh, had something to say, and I would not invest uh, uh, much in my company if I know that the investment uh, goes to the workers later. So maybe I would, but um, <laughs> not the, not the <laughs> capital <laughs> owners we know. <coughs> Okay, the, the second part is uh, what about um, uh, promoting worker ownership in case of an insolvency of a normal privately owned business. Um, there has not been a big discussion about that within my party, but, uh, oh, what's that? Probably not a genuine company. It's probably <laughs> a privately owned company here in Microsoft. That's why it doesn't work. <coughs> okay, well, it, um, this is not, uh, has not been a big discussion within my party yet about this, but um, there is discussion going on in the left in Germany outside of the outside of the party <laughs> in like more um, um, uh, among other critics. Um, yeah, um, I want to present this system uh, that comes from Italy and that might serve as a realistic role model for lawmakers in in other countries <coughs> as well, since. Uh, I work for the political party Die Linke. I, my job is basically to think about uh, what could government do or progressive government could do to support uh, worker ownership. And, and uh, so I always, it's, so it's all a bit more theoretical and it's a m bit more of a top down view because, <laughs> because I have to think about what could the government do to support uh, people that want to uh, take over the company, for example. Um, yeah, um, I'm talking about the Macora law from Italy. After good lobbying from uh, cooperative federations and trade unions, the Italian government introduced that law in 1985. Um, it was explicitly introduced to support workers whose company went bankrupt and who wanted to turn this company into a cooperative. Um, basically, the Macora system worked and in a different way uh, still works like this. Um, the state invests through uh, special financing societies. It was mainly the uh, CFI, the Compagnia Finanziaria Industriale. Oh, I'm not very good in Italian, <coughs> I guess. Um, <coughs> the state invests um, for five to ten years, three to five times of what the workers invest into the co into the cooperative, and each worker gets a sum uh, worth three years of unemployment benefits to invest in the cooperative. So. Um, if a company goes bankrupt and the workers decide, yeah, we want to take over this company and uh, and, and keep it uh, keep it running, um, and if they have a good plan, then each worker gets three years of unemployment benefits capitalized to invest into this new cooperative, and um, on top, the state uh, invests three to five times of what the workers invest. Um, <coughs> yeah, the CFI, this Compagnia Finanziaria Industriale. Uh, which was run by cooperatives federations uh, doesn't only manage the investment stuff but also um, assists the work of the cooperative it takes part in the board meetings and so on that's important because that's how the workers get a lot of know-how and learn how to run the company and bring it back on track so that's a yeah it's a professional uh, aid so to say um, 
Because state subsidies are proportional to the capital subscribed by the members, as I said, uh, workers tend to invest more themselves. Um, so the cooperatives created uh, didn't have the problem of a lack of capital that, uh, that other cooperatives uh, sometimes have. <coughs> Can I have two minutes more? Yeah. Okay. All in all, the Makora law was quite successful. Um, I have to say that it's not easy to find good information in English or in German about the law. Uh, and its effects, <laughs> but uh, one publication I found mentioned that between 1985 and 1998, 160 companies uh, that would otherwise have gone bankrupt survived as a new cooperative founded under the Mamora <coughs> law. Uh, 6,000 jobs were saved like that. Uh, in another public publication, it said that until 92, about one tenth of the newly founded cooperatives didn't survive, yet others say uh, that the share of failures was much lower. Um, Actually, everybody you talk to from, from Italy or so say that it, it was a really um, successful uh, um, experiment or a, a, success, a success, successful law. <coughs> yeah. Important maybe to say is also that a study carried out by that uh, CFI showed that also the state won in this game. Um, although the state invested uh, much money itself into the, in the, into the new corporations, uh, cooperatives, it saved much more because of the lower unemployment and the taxes paid by successful cooperatives. So it was a win-win situation. So to However, there are also problems that make the Makora law less valuable as a role model maybe. Uh, from a left perspective, it is hard to tolerate that the workers lost their right to unemployment benefits in exchange for the capitalization of those benefits for three years. Uh, as I said, uh, you get uh, as a worker you get three years of unemployment benefits capitalized and so you lose the right, actually, uh, to get unemployment benefits if the, comp uh, if the new cooperative fails. Uh, for me, that's a problem. And uh, one would have to discuss possibilities probably to avoid this problem. Um, less problematic from a social point of view, but nevertheless a problem for a realistic implementation of a Makora-like law in Europe is the stubbornness of the European policymakers when it comes to state subsidies. Um, the European U Union stated in 97 that the Makora law violates uh, European rules and stopped the execution of the law for five years. Um, finally, in 2003, the Makora system restarted under new rules um, and under uh, a new law, uh, but now the state is only allowed to finance the same or sometimes twice the amount of what the workers invest, invest into the company. So, uh, uh, originally, it used to be three to five times of what the workers invest, and now uh, the state is only uh, allowed to um, to invest uh, twice the amount, or, or maybe sometimes the same uh, amount, and that's often not enough to have <coughs> successful uh, takeovers. Uh, that's it, a short insight into what is discussed among the left party in Germany. So, well, thank you very much for your patience.